Hi, my name is John Chambers. I'm a senior manager at Price Bailey. I've been working in tax for over 15 years and I specialise in property tax, restructuring and more generally business tax. This is a recent release of debt tax case called Simon England and Another and HMRC. In terms of the case summary, uh, the case transcript refers to a discovery assessment issued by HMRC relating to a release of debt that had not been declared in the director's 2013-14 tax returns. A discovery assessment can be raised if HMRC become aware that too little tax has been self-assessed. In this case, the directors owe just over a million pounds to the company. This is not an uncommon situation for owner-managed businesses, and we do often see transactions between the company and its owners. However, there are tax consequences for both the company and the borrowers, if they are participators, typically shareholders of the company. Where a loan to shareholders is released, it's treated first and foremost as a dividend for tax purposes in the year of release. There may also be Class 1 national insurance if they are directors, but that's outside the scope of this case review. Dividend taxation changed quite substantially in 2016, introducing, for example, the tax-free dividend allowance that we now uh, know. Maximum dividend rates in 1314, when this case relates to, were up to 37.5%. So back to the case, the company itself went into liquidation in 2012. The directors entered into a settlement agreement with the company via liquidator in October 2013. The agreement required them to pay £100,000 over two years and for the remaining £909,000 to be released. The agreement included a clause that stated if the debtors fail to make any of the payments, i.e. towards the £100,000, then the whole of the liability is due and payable immediately. The agreement was stated to be a full and final settlement of the liability subject to payment of the £100,000. There was no dispute in this case over whether the directors were within the scope of these dividend rules. HMRC argued that under the settlement agreement, the liquidator agreed to take a lower sum of £100,000 and therefore to release the remaining 909000 the director's professed inability to pay the full liability supported the view that the liquidator had accepted £100,000 because this was what they considered the directors were likely to be able to pay, i.e. what they could afford at that time, not because there was any uncertainty as to the amount owed. HMRC therefore contended that the release took place when the settlement agreement was signed in October 2013 and not on a later date. So turning to the taxpayers' arguments, they argue that the debt had not been released at the time of entering the settlement agreement because the agreement itself required a security on the debt at all times. If they'd failed to pay the £100,000 within two years, the whole liability became payable immediately. They also argued that there was therefore no release on the date of the agreement as the debt was potentially still payable in full and therefore existed beyond the date of that agreement. Therefore, from the arguments put forward, it appears that the directors would have agreed that the 909,000 would have been considered as released for tax purposes after the end of the two years in which they had to repay the £100,000, i.e. in November 2015, not 2013-14. So turning to the tribunal's view, the liquidator accepted £100,000 as settlement of the debt on the basis that that was what they could afford and so it was accepted that the remaining £909,000 was released under the settlement agreement. The tribunal concluded that in substance the transaction was one of release and write-off of the £909,000 and that this took place in November 13, when the agreement was signed. So there are often disputes and negotiations with HMRC when both sides' arguments have merit, as seen in this situation. I would al always therefore recommend that timely and professional advice is sought when dealing with uncommon, high-value or complex transactions. It can save a lot of time and expense down the line. The two main issues affecting clients during an inquiry, or in this case a discovery, are time and costs in the form of ongoing correspondence or negotiations with HMRC. Added to this is the stress that people can experience during, during an investigation. 
In this particular case, the taxpayers lost, meaning that interest and potentially penalties would be sought by HMRC. If they weren't covered by a tax investigations policy, it's easy to see how the cost of such an exercise can soon melt. All cases are assessed on their own facts, but a tax investigations policy can cover ongoing costs for their advisors corresponding with HMRC towards resolution of the inquiry. In certain circumstances, costs may also be covered for appealing to the tribunal. So, to conclude, having a policy in place can offer peace of mind, which is why we always recommend this type of cover to our clients.